So thanks, John. Thanks for inviting me to talk uh, to Baron Bio. Um, last time was, I think it was 2014. And um, I actually spoke about Toro Hill then as well, but in a completely different setting because we know a lot more now than we did in 2014. So it's by time to update uh, <coughs> the, the, our narrative about Toro Hill. So Toro Hill, between heaven and a hard place. Um, so we're looking at we're looking at the flat top of of, um, of Toro Hill, and on that very flat top, that's more than meets the eye because I can see now the the zoom in the lower part of the image. There's a large boreal cairn on the left hand side, which you can barely make out with the naked eye, but with a good lens you will see it. And beyond that that, that boreal cairn, uh, there's also a large number of remains. Summit. I think you can see my mouse up there. On this very limited summit, you have the boreal cairn, but you also have a large amount of smaller remains that will be focused for this talk today. So, uh, what we've done up there, we've done a couple of surveys. We over a good few years. We also done some excavations and a number of field walking uh, <coughs> projects to try to create. A narrative and trying to understand how literally how people used and understood this conspicuous mountain in prehistory. And that's kind of this the kind of the bottom line of our ambition with this project. But first I do a bit of detour because I think it's needed. And I say that when when interpreting prehistoric landscapes, an important focus is to try to understand how people perceived their world by interpreting the landscape they created and lived in. This particular river, for example, has 26 rapids, consisting of water flowing through the physical landscape. We can see that, but what we can't see are the legends and stories linked to it, or its role in local ideologies and local beliefs. We can't even see the names that people gave to the rapids and the calm waters in between. But just because we can't see them, doesn't mean that they were of less importance to people in the past, of course. The physical aspect of the landscape do stand a good chance to be understood, while the possibilities of understanding the more kind of subjective meanings that people attached to the landscape are, of course, more limited. Nevertheless, we can, based on the relation between archaeological remains and the physical landscape, sometimes reach into that invisible landscape of people in the past, or at least try to create a possible narrative of a place in prehistory. And that is partly what this talk would be about. Place, people create places, and why? Many of the archaeological sites that remain today were places where people gathered for different reasons. Megalithic tombs, hill forts, castles, burial mounds, standing stones, etc., etc. But there were also a large number of places where people gathered that today are less obvious or maybe not at all visible in the archaeological record. A cliff, a waterfall, a strange tree, or a place with a particular view. The natural landscape strongly influences people not only in their daily routine but also in the kind of construction of their beliefs. Different terrains would present different conditions for creating belief systems and ideologies. Simply said, people beliefs and rituals are to a certain degree a reflection of the landscape around them. The landscape do have an effect on us in various ways. Mountains or high ground have always had a special role as places of significance. Mountains are often charged with special meaning and it's the enigmatic quality of high places, their prominence, their permanence, but also, of course also their presence that draw us to them. Mountain as foci for belief systems and rituals or ritual routines are well recognized all around the world and many are considered to be kind of sacred mountains. This is Ben Bulban up in Sligo. 
What makes mountains such a universal religious vehicle in often very different societies is the symbolic capacity to unite earth with heaven, to bridge that gap between the mundane living world and the other world, to create an axis mundi. Some mountains may play part in creation myths and ideologies, but might have a passive role by not being the focal point for rituals or monuments linked to rituals. An example of that is the Mount Roraima in Brazil, which by the indigenous people is seen as the stump of a mighty tree that once held all the types of fruits and edible plants known to man. In some contexts, the summit of the mountain has been used for rituals and buildings linked to them. The peak sanctuaries in Crete is a good example of that. In this case, it's the summit that counts. The verticality of the mountain is the focus. So the summit is what actually is the important bit. In other contexts, the mountains is not, are not climbed at all. It is left alone and venerated at a distance. And the best example of that is probably Uluru in Australia. Closer to home, Crookpatrick. Uh, again, a mountain with tons of symbolism and the, and the, and the, <coughs> the, the fight with, between the Hindus and, and the Christian faith and by Patrick's fastening, uh, fastening on the summit. Mountains do, however, not exist in isolation, since our understanding of the road is from a lowland perspective only. The interplay between the mountain and the surrounding lowland is therefore important when on, to understand the role mountains might have played in prehistoric societies. The uplands of Ireland were actively used in various ways, from the Neolithic all through to medieval times and beyond. In some areas, conspicuous mountain tops were used for megalithic tombs, creating prominence and presence with strictly ritual connotations indicating a very strong ambition of creating a visual and physical presence and no better example than Nocturne in County Sligo of that aspect of using a high ground. There are however also evidence of both domestic and ritual remains in extreme upland locations where a strong visual impact seems to have been of less importance. In these cases, the presence of the place is very obvious, but the remains or the activities on that place or summit are not really visible at all from the lowland. And this is the type of site I've been talking about this evening. So the Burren in County Clare is today, with its spectacular karst landscape, a place apart, with its dramatic topography and extraordinary contrast between all shades of grey and green. The appearance of the Burren for any traveler coming from the east is a dramatic experience, as the line of mountains looked like a huge, gray, impenetrable screen. The physical presence of this geological barrier is very strong, and it's inevitable that it always had a very strong cultural connotations. This is the physical frontier between the dramatic landscape we today call the Burren uplands and the world outside. And in that northeastern corner of the Baranaplans, we do find Turlough Hill. From the east, looking into Turlough Hill, this hill doesn't really make any noise at all. It's hardly discernible. It just creates a level space between Slip Kern to the left, the lower part of the image, and Church Hill Oak Mama to the right. Turlough Hill is uh, located though besides Schlieve Cairn, which is its highly visible cairn. You can see that on the lower, uh, smaller image. And that is the cairn that you can see from your car passing Gort on the motorway. That cairn, that cairn is really has an extremely high visibility but you can rarely see the cairn on Turlough Hill because it's more inland from that angle. So from outside, or the, the outside barn, 
Torochid is very discreet. But from within, Thorin, it's a spectacular mountain with its changing shape all the time as one is moving around in the valley below. And the high ridge has an overall length of about 1,200 meters. I think you can see my cursor here. So that's the high ridge for those of you that still haven't been up there. And it consists, in fact, of two summits separated by a slightly lower ground. So you have a western summit and you have an eastern summit and then you have a slightly lower ground in the middle. And the higher western summit constitutes a level flat area, while the slightly lower eastern summit is more rounded. The ground on Torochil is no surprise, more or less bare limestone pavement, and today no soil exists in large part of, of, of that, uh, so those summits. So when it comes to the archaeology, <coughs> um, to use the word conundrum is an understatement. Um, so we mainly have five different type of, of remains. <coughs> on the western summit, the red space here, uh, within that space, we have some 150, 160 round house foundations or houses, or remains of houses. We have the summit cairn, and also on that very flat summit, we have a labyrinth or labyrinthine, I will come back to that. And then on the eastern summit, we have the large 225 meters enclosure. And then down below in the valley, in the saddle between the Torochil and Schlievkarn, we have the long cairn. So five different elements uh, to that, <coughs> to the, that creates the archaeological picture uh, or, or footprint of, of Torochil as we know it. The summit cairn, um, 18 meters diameter, substantial cairn, uh, but the most interesting bit with that cairn is that it still has, it retains this kind of part of the drywalling sides, so you have a vertical sides uh, with drywalling, and that very few cairns have that. The cairn that we see just behind and still current don't have it, but this has the drywalling, uh, and you see that on the lower right as well. And this is partly how many of the large cairns would have looked like, and that would have made it then to stand out much clearer against the skyline and the kind of more ruined shape that we often see today. That's the bar never excavated. I'll come back to that later on. The, considering the houses, there are some 156 circular wall footings recorded on the summit. They range from about six to 10 meters in diameter. And some of them are conjoined, as you can see from this plan. And the overall trend seems to be that they occur in small groups or three to four tightly clustered uh, houses. Uh, they also seem to be distributed more or less over the entire length of the summit, but the tightest or the most dense concentration seem to be towards the center. You have two large depressions in the center, but you have two kind of focal points when it comes to distribution. They also seem to avoid the space around this, this labyrinth, but also seem to avoid the space around the cairn. I come back to that. They are all stone built. You can see some are sticking up in the grass below. And, um, and some are actually grass covered where you do have some soil cover. But they're very simple and small. And until we started the survey, we just knew there were many of them. We didn't know much more, more than that. Some of, this, of the houses have been, this is from a digital terrain model. Some of the houses are built on top of the pavement. These are the red ones here. So built on top, but some are also excavated or quarried down into the pavement. So it's kind of big sunken floors. It's a bit unusual. So <clears throat> our kind of, where we started, uh, we knew there was a large amount of hot sites, and we had the burial cairn, and uh, we didn't have that much more really on the summit. We didn't know when, what, or why. We didn't know how old they were. We didn't know what they were, and we definitely didn't know why they were on the top. They could be Neolithic, they could be Bronze Age, they could be Iron Age, they could even be medieval. 
So <clears throat> with that kind of those kind of questions in mind, we thought it was worthwhile to at least do some minor small excavations up on the summit, uh, which of course uh, has been a fantastic experience to be to take part of. Oh. Our problem was that we didn't have this good plan when we started, so we decided to excavate. So we, we picked two conjoined sites. These two guys here to the left and two in the, that cluster. We wanted one on the west side and one, one on the east side and one on the west side, um, just to give some kind of representativity. And um, <laughs> so those were the two, the two locations for the excavation. And maintain is always sunny in the barn, even though if the weather is terrible. Uh, so uh, this was the kind of the core of the of the <coughs> of the team, and uh, some of you uh, might even be listening in today. And um, with the kind of Mary and Margaret there and Richie and, and Eileen and so on. And then to the left we have we have uh, Noel McCarthy and Ross Omordine, who were the uh, site directors. We started off on a terrible weather, uh, at least when it comes to rain, but the humor was very, very good. Long walk every day, every morning, and um, <clears throat> this is halfway up the hill. The good news was that we didn't have to carry the wheelbarrow every day, and uh, so uh, we only brought one wheelbarrow up, uh, but that did the job uh, towards the end. Ross and uh, Noel, uh, two of my uh, PhDs, uh, colleagues that uh, were conducting or, or um, <coughs> overlooking the excavations and running the excavations on the, uh, on the summit. The excavations were very, very limited, very, very limited. You nearly feel guilty bringing a spade up into a threshold place like this. So you have to be very careful what you do and to, to minimize the impact. So we, we picked two narrow trenches that we knew would actually do the job. So uh, two trial cuttings to cover two conjoined houses each. And uh, <coughs> yeah, I come back, sorry, come back, go back to that. Uh, what was evident, this is literally, Richie is on the sitting on the right hand side at the furthest end of, of, so you do have one circular, you have to imagine that one circular house foundation there, and then you have the second one here. The floors were completely gone. By the, by the weathering of the limestone. And that's important to be aware of. So, and all the fissuring or the fissures, they developed after the houses have been used. So anything that would have been deposited in the houses would have been penetrated down into the fissures over time. This is just a selection of images of the, this is the kind of layout of the, one of the, the, the cuttings and you could make out one of the houses and the other house there and cutting straight through it. And this is the very same cut, with a big kind of collection of, of large slabs, which I come back to, and then the inner part of one of the houses, and then the, beyond that, the outer part. It's interesting and it's complicated to work on in, in the borough when it comes to archaeology as because limestone is very much a living, uh, living rock. Uh, but what was became very evident, and we knew that from other projects in the barn, is that the, the weathering, the creation of the grikes, uh, was actually happening after the site had been abandoned. And especially then if you have soil, or if you have bedrock that was being exposed. So in this case, if you can figure out on the right hand side here, this is a part that hasn't been creating grikes, and this corresponds because this had been covered with a bit of a wall. And this is literally this area up here. So you have one part that had been covered with the wall footing. Underneath that, you wouldn't have the developing of the grikes in the same way. So we know that the bedrock, of course, was tight. And one entity, when these sites were used. <clears throat> but then, of course, as, as the, 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 the concealed and, and wrapped with the soil, creates this heavy weathering over time and everything would have been seeping down into this, these voids. So the excavation was a lot about grikes, understanding grikes, excavating grikes, this more or less disappearing into grikes. And uh, <clears throat> it, this has also forced 
the development of some interesting excavation uh, equipment and, and Richard turned out to be a master on that. So these are some of the, of the tools that uh, we actually had to use. And um, I could say that it was close to impossible needed to get all this, the material up from the Gwaiks because it was so deep, it could be 40, 50, maybe 60 centimeters deep uh, to fish everything up. So, uh, but the most exciting bit, what did we find? This is Eileen and this is Ross looking at in one of the boxes where we were supposed to keep our finds. So what did we find? Well, we um, found nothing. That's the, that's the short answer. The houses turned out to be empty. Besides, some small bits of charcoal and some fragments of hazelnut shells. Hazelnut shells occurs in more or less every prehistoric site. Uh, bits of charcoal uh, could also be very <coughs> common. But beyond that, no lithics, no pottery, no bones, no nothing. So in a way, in a way, rather disappointing, but in a way not, which I'll come back to. Well, we did find a heart. So um, this is Ross, and, and uh, so where the arrow ends, there was fragments of a very limited, but still a heart, uh, so a fireplace in one of the houses. So the remains of a fireplace. <clears throat> and that was kind of good news, because together with that, and together with the, with the hazelnut and some spread charcoal, we were able to get a series of dates. And the C14 dates, a series of eight out of 10 dates, focus around 900 to 1000 BC. So we are looking at late Bronze Age dates uh, for these uh, house remains. And that seemed to be fairly consistent because the window was fairly limited uh, when it came to the site. During the excavations, we also did a survey because, uh, as I said, we didn't know how many sites there were when it comes to houses. <coughs> uh, we didn't know what they really looked like when it comes to the houses. Uh, we didn't know how they were related. Um, we just kn knew there were many, but beyond that, we know very little. So we did a survey of the entire summit, an extremely low tech survey in the sense that we hand drew everything. We didn't have a total station with us by purpose. And uh, so with my, myself and colleague Doug Hammer uh, did that survey uh, parallel with the excavations. And uh, that survey then <coughs> resulted in this uh, plan, which we're delighted with, because it was the first time we could actually put a finger on how many sites there are how they look like. And we knew, know now that we do have some 156. They're round, they're oval, they're U-shaped. You can see from the plant that some are uh, literally U-shaped or open, like you, if you look at the right, down in the right hand here now, you have those that are open U-shaped, and some U-shaped that are joined, while others are completely rounded. They also occur in single, they occur as pairs, they become as three uh, joined together. Some are quarried, some are not. Some have entrances, so most of them have entrances or doorways in some way. What is striking though, that's very little linear features. No kind of remains of any kind of field walls or any kind of partitioning of the space up on the summit. Also, in fact, that some of them seem to have inward leaning slabs. So you can see that they're literally facing in most all the sites. So probably supporting some kind of superstructure. You could have usually have some, some kind of post with hides uh, or something. And these stones have been used and to keep them, keep the this, this superstructure down, maybe from the wind. We also had quite often, uh, it occurred, stack of slabs in one part of our of, of house. There seems to be collecting a number of slabs, maybe for repairs or maybe for, we don't know what, because there's no particular arrangement, but they seem to be stacked at kind of a, <coughs> a good supply of large slabs uh, in certain parts of many of the houses. We also found a number of entrance slabs. It really kind of looked nearly like, <coughs> like, um, it's a, like this is the house of Fiona and Finbar, some kind of signpost. It was a big slab, often very close to the doorway, to the opening. 
Uh, so some kind of signal that this was the entrance into a house. So we gained a lot of information about the construction of the houses, even though we only excavated two houses in a very limited way. So much for the cairn and for the houses. Then we have the labyrinth or the labyrinthine, whatever we should like to call it, a labyrinth-like feature. Uh, this is the gray guy up here to the right. Um, it's, I don't even know how to describe it actually. It's about 30 meters across. And it consists of very, very faint, low banks of gravel and limestone shingles. They could be from nearly nothing up to a bit nearly a foot high. And uh, it was discovered by chance, to be honest. And, uh, and we had really, really serious problem recording it because it was so hard to, to, to detect and to actually decide its layout. And after about two days, uh, we managed to come to this kind of conclusion. This is what it looks like. So it's about 30 meters in diameter overall. So it's fairly substantial. And it's not really a true labyrinth in any way, but it really looks like a tattoo gone wrong. Don't know what happened. And up to the right, you can see the kind of the level space or the level area where it's located. Interesting enough, all the houses seem to avoid or seem to create a corridor around this feature. So it seems like it's been in operation or, <laughs> or venerated in some way respected during the use of the houses. So that's the so-called labyrinth, literally no comparison in Ireland. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. And finally then on the summit, the eastern summit, we do have the large 225 meter enclosure. Um, this large enclosure with the diameter 225 meter consists of a single rampart and has a roughly hexagonal ground plan. And the enclosure is hardly kind of a defense structure due to the single and rather low rampart in certain bits, but also the fact that it has at least 10 entrances. So it's not a very clever construction from a defensive point of view. And down to the right hand side, if you can see my cursor, there's a gorge opening straight into the center, a natural gorge, uh, which is not which is not covered up by a rampart or a wall. So it gives a free access into it together with the number of small entrances that I'm just pointing out in the cursor here. There's a number of entrances all along the perimeter of the site. Also, there are some 10, 12 houses abutting the, uh, the um, rampart in different places. This site was surveyed by Westrop in 1904, and uh, he couldn't either make head or tail of what it was. He realized it wasn't a castle, uh, it wasn't a fort, um, it was he just didn't know what it was. But what he did know was that it didn't fit into the pattern of castles or any kind of features that he knew uh, that existed in the barn, which was interesting. And, but this is his plan at the top of the, of the image. And also his drawing of one of the nicely constructed entrances. And this is probably the same entrance today. And down to the right, you see the gorge or the, the big depression leaning into the large uh, enclosure. The ground in the enclosure is literally empty. It's just karst limestone. Uh, while you do have a few hut sites or roundhouses abutting the rampart at the corners and also along the, along the perimeter. But absolutely hardly anything in the center at all to be discovered. So <clears throat> the, uh, besides the sites on the summit, which I've been talking about, the, the, the houses, the cairn, the labyrinth, and the large enclosure, we also found, and that, that was literally discovered just a few years ago, a large, long cairn located in the saddle, in the low point between Turok Hill and Shlilkarn. It's just indicated by the arrow here. And that long cairn is also spectacularly strange uh, <clears throat> because it's about 90 meters length, length which is a considerable length. Uh, it's linear, but it's also meandering. It kind of snakes its way eastwards down, slightly, partly downhill. And you can see on the upper image here, it just looks like a big rumble of rocks 
that actually is meandering down towards the, the, the lower uh, or the, the, the hillside. It also has one, possibly two, megalithic structures or chambers. And Frank Hoyne, a colleague of mine to the left of the rig site, uh, or the orange color rig site, is uh, <coughs> looking into one of these chambers. So it's a megalithic construction. And the lower right, you can see the image as well, looking up towards it. It's just a big rumble of stones. It doesn't really make sense at all, but it's a, it's a long cairn. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, also, this is the site I'm talking about. So it kind of snakes its way downhill. There's also an additional long cairn feature at the right angle, just, just below that downhill, a conundrum. You don't just know of any long cairns of this kind of extent and character in Ireland. So to sum up, uh, <coughs> what are we looking at? We, are, we have a summit with about 150 houses. We have a round cairn. Uh, and and uh, we have a multi valid or we have a labyrinth enclosure on that on, on that summit as well. And we do have a very large hexagonal stone enclosure, all on the exposed summit of Tolochil. And then down to the right, we have this long megalithic long cairn and on the lower slopes. And this collection of prehistoric sites constitutes a more or less a unique group of monuments on this particular hill. There are, however, some interesting parallels that can be made, and one of them is related to the number of houses, which I think is worth uh, making at this point. And this is <coughs> Karakil and Malik Farna in, in uh, and this is the only comparable site in Ireland, really. Uh, <coughs> we have in on Malik Farna in South Sligo uh, on this uh, plateau, lower plateau here, this area. There are some 160 uh, circular or round houses that we surveyed a few years ago. And this sits among the, either the passage tomb complex or Karakilkir's Corn. And, uh, and so the elevated plateau is home to a large cluster of houses that probably could be linked to the passage tombs. It's not really a mountain top as such, but the definition reminds a bit of Turlo Hill that you have a very well-defined flat space <coughs> and uh, the access up to this vertical, surrounded by vertical cliffs is literally only one point. So in this case, you could argue that it's kind of slightly more defendable in a way. And this is the, just a plan of, of Malik Farna and uh, the about 166 circular house foundations. And they've been dated to the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. So they do have some kind of common ground. <coughs> and uh, I think the main common ground they do have these two sites is that they are places out of the ordinary when it comes to topography, uh, is when it comes to places of significance or drama. But they also differ in a very interesting way. And this is the only more comparison I make between the two. Uh, the red are the diameters of the sites or the houses in Turlo Hill. They're very small, very even. And not really any large sites. It seems to be very uniform sites or, 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 or hot sites. While in the Malik Farna case, there are some seriously big, nearly up to 20 meters. So you have a complete hierarchy when it comes to the structure and the complexity. But at Turtle Hill, we seem to be looking at a very uniform <coughs> structure and a uniform building mode uh, of houses. So, <coughs> We do have, if you're looking at the date overall of what we're looking at, uh, uh, we're looking at the houses that seems to be focusing around 1000 BC, the later Bronze Age. The cairn on the summit could probably possibly be Neolithic. So any time between say 3,500 and 2,500, we do have comparison uh, <coughs> with the cairn. And, 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 uh, and Pulawak, for example, in, in the bottom also a Neolithic uh, burial cairn with partly vertical sides. The labyrinth is impossible to date, but its location indicates that it might be contemporary with the work earlier than the houses that surrounds it. And as I said, the houses could be dated to the late Bronze Age. Uh, 
The dating of the huge hexagonal enclosure on the eastern summit is complicated, to say the least. It does, however, to some degree resemble the large open assembly sites from the Neolithic that we call causewayed enclosures. And these causewayed enclosures in the Neolithic are defined by ditches interrupted by a number of causeways from which they have got the name. But instead of causeways between ditch segments, the number of gaps in the rampart and Toro Hill might be seen as fulfilling a similar role. But nothing could be said with any kind of <coughs> definite, definite uh, can be said def definitely at, at this stage. The long cairn and then to the right uh, in the saddle, well, we just don't know. Uh, a good guess would be that it's possibly prehistoric and possibly maybe Neolithic. The megalithic chamber indicates a Neolithic date. Uh, but it could also, for some strange reason, belong to the Bronze Age. So what is it? Uh, what are we looking at? Uh, <coughs> I think that the large, we you look at the largest, one of the largest cluster of prehistoric houses in, uh, on, on the island. Um, the cairn is not really unique in such, um, but in the labyrinth like, or the labyrinthine thing is really unique in many, many ways. The enormous enclosure uh, with the numerous entrances is definitely uh, a unique feature. And then the bizarre long cairn in the saddle. So and one could ask, answer the, uh, wonder then, what about the rest of Boron? Is this a once-off? And yes, it is. It is a once-off. Uh, we have serious uh, uh, effort into surveying and field walking in the Boron plant, and nowhere do we have, for example, any number of hot, hot sites comparable to Chalokhi. And so judging by the Judging by the remains, Toroch Hill was not just another hilltop in the mountainous Burry landscape. What were people doing up here on this exposed and bleak hilltop, which to a modern visitor mainly offers fantastic views and acres of fresh air? Uh, as these are qualities hardly unique to Toroch Hill, there must have been something more. How should we understand the role and function of the unique enclosure with its many entrances? Why Turtle Hill and not on the higher, larger, and more impressive Schlieb Kern or any other of the high mountains in the, to the west? From, the, from extensive field working, as I said, we know that there's no counterpart in other parts of the world. As the circular house remains of domestic dwellings, where they actually, where people lived, did, did people actually live up here? From the location of the summit, it is to me evident that the houses do not represent ordinary prehistoric farmsteads. They have been built to meet demands linked to something beyond the ordinary, beyond the daily routine. Also, lack of any field walls or linear features to keep the animals out or in indicates that this is something different. And this is an extremely exposed summit with literally no shelter and the only two to some degree sheltered places, the two large depressions in the center, uh, in fact, lack any houses. I would suggest that the house sites represent probably one concerted phase of activity. No houses seem to be overlapping, for example, and the general distribution indicates a certain degree of overall planning regarding their spatial relationships. Even though the circular house foundations are domestic in character, they are, despite all, remains of houses. I find it very hard to see that the role of function would have been primarily domestic. It's hardly conceivable that people would, for any length of time would have been living on this very inaccessible and exposed hilltop. So they probably didn't live up here. Uh, are we looking then at a hill fort? Well, date corresponds to the late Bronze Age hill fort epoch. But vast areas of sheltered flat space immediately to the south and below the summit, not only, not one single found house foundation in these areas. So this space and this space to the south here, vast areas of flat accessible space, not any remains of any archaeology. No, all the houses had to be on the summit. They made an effort to climb those last eight meters up onto the flat exposed space that the summit offered.
the way sorry and go back to that the way the houses have been placed on the summit at Turlock Hill and their obvious relation to the only two non-domestic sites that is the cairn and the and the uh, labyrinth suggests to me that the houses probably had a role that could be linked to these two maybe non-domestic features or that they were built and used at a time when the significance of the cairn and the labyrinth was still revered. Two groups of people maybe, two types of ritual monuments in two halves of the large uh, summit. Uh, it could be a place for ritual gatherings. Um, some sort of ritual gatherings. I make a comparison here with the very far-fetched, but not really, church villages in Swedish Lapland where the Sami population come together once or twice or three times a year uh, to marry or, or to, to bury the dead and to uh, undertake various types of rituals. Every family have their own, in this case, happen to be round hot. That's more a coincidence. But that kind of gathering place for ritual reasons uh, might be a useful com a comparison. If we look at the actual location, finally, of Tolochil, being at the very edge of the burn, overlooking the plains to the west, to the east. This location occupies a liminal space between two very different landscapes and may have offered some kind of neutral ground for activities shared with groups based maybe outside the barn. Also, a symbolically strategic location at the edge of a territory, but with no kind of external visibility so the site of the location has many qualities. Another way of trying to understand a unique <coughs> cluster of prehistoric remains on Turlock Hill may be to see it in the context within the barn, and then in relation to the row the wedge tombs probably serve as ritual focal points uh, within the local community in the early Bronze Age. And this is the distribution of the wedge tombs. Now, this would not necessarily be related to the houses from the late Bronze Age, but definitely to the cairn on the summit. The northern part of the burn more or less completely lacks wedge tombs, and it might be so that Turlock Hill fulfilled a role as a centralized ritual powerhouse in this part of the burn, in difference to the wedge tombs to the south, which were distributed in a completely different way in that landscape. Whatever Whatever role this mountain might have played in prehistory, I think it's clear that the character and complexity of the archaeological remains at Turlock Hill are without counterparts in the prehistoric landscape of the bar and beyond. And I think the unique cluster of houses on the summit, together with the various ritual monuments, clearly show that this mountain had a very special meaning to people in pre prehistoric bar. It was not just another sitting mountain in this dramatic terrain. It was a place that people knew of. The true significance and meaning we will, of course, we'll never know. But remember the visible and the invisible landscapes I mentioned initially. And you can be sure there was a lot more to Turlock Hill than meets our eyes today. And I just end with this. Uh, image of the proud owner, Michael John Conley, who is the main, and, and also thank you to Mike and the other landowners, to, to let, be letting us work on their land for, for a number of years, and we are keeping doing so. so. He's a proud owner and guardian of this treasure of a hill. And so I end with that, and um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, Stefan. That was um, absolutely marvelous. Um, a wonderful story and, and so well told. Um, I just look at Michael John there, and I think it's probably um, nice of us to remember as well this evening. Some of you will know Tommy McGann from Ogavanon, um, the valley just to the east of, of Turlock Hill. And Tommy, um, some of you will have known him. He was buried in Corkham Row, so maybe it's nice to remember him because I'm sure he was spent his life looking across at Turlock Hill. Um, so um, condolences to Tommy and his family. So thank you so much, Stefan. We're going to go straight to questions because there's a good few of them in already. Um, so maybe to start with Conor Fahey, 
Could the large enclosure be a trap for herds of wild goats where maybe 100 or more people could drive large numbers of goat to the enclosure and seal it off uh, at the 10 entrances? Yeah, I, 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 I hate when people say it's a good question, but that's a good question. Um, yeah, it could be. It could be. Uh, this, what is surprising in a way in that context is that the the entrances are so well constructed. So it seems to be more than, if I may say so, more than just gathering animals or, or, or like, a, like, like a trap for, 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 for catching animals. Uh, so there seems to be a lot of effort put into the construction of the individual entrances. And, um, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, uh, I, I take a note on that because we haven't really actually thought of, of, of it's in relation to goats or any animals of that kind of character. Um, it is a bit tricky because you do have the large gorge coming in from the east uh, leading into it and you could literally drive herds of animals in, in through that. Um, but then why would you have 10, 15 exits, you know, but, um, Okay, um, moving on, another question from uh, anonymous attendee. Are there ideas around the number of people that houses such as this might accommodate? Well, we, one can theorize about, about this. These houses are fairly small. They're, they're talking about eight, 10 meters in diameter. So if you slept in a house, you could probably sleep four or five. Um, but I maybe not, didn't stress that enough. I see this, the, 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 the fact that we didn't find anything, I think, to me, is a strong indicator that people actually didn't spend any long time up here. I think they might have come up for a weekend, and that's the reason why I make the comparison with the with the Swedish uh, Sami example. Uh, very short visits, uh, probably for uh, to attending large gathering or to attending an event, and that's the reason why you wouldn't actually have any lithics, you wouldn't have any remains, you wouldn't have any working in the huts. You literally just slept in them. So from that perspective, you could probably house more people in these kind of dwellings than you would in a normally if you lived there uh, year round, if I put it that way. And a related question, um, Stefan, is it unusual not to find anything in a house sites such as these? It is unusual. It is unusual. Uh, I mean, uh, like the, even in Malik Farna, which would be the, the similar conditions really with, with the karst uh, limestone plateau, we did have extensive remains of, of lithics and also bones and pottery. Uh, literally nothing in, 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 in these two cuttings. And that, I think that's very indicative. To be honest, if you, if you ask me, which you do, uh, I'm very happy not finding anything because it, it feeds into a possible narrative uh, that, uh, that uh, I can see uh, that we could use for the, for the role of the hill. Thank you, Stefan. Um, there's a couple of people who have raised their hands. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe you can type in your questions in the Q&A button. Great question from Dara Hogan. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Amazing that there were so many houses up there. Are there any myths or stories that have reference to this cairn or settlement like there is for Maeve's cairn in Sligo? Not really in the, to the same extent, to be honest. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not really the right person to ask about myths and legends, but I'm, according to what, what the, 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 the research we've been doing, there's very little link to Turtle Hill per se. Uh, and, the, and the fact is that uh, there's nothing really mentioned um, besides the cairn uh, before Westrop uh, comes into the picture in the turn of the century. Uh, so nothing has really been 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 done, but there might be. I mean, no. I mean, people would have more knowledge than I would in local myths and local legend linked to this, which I would be delighted to hear about. Okay, thank you. The next question from Martin Deer: With all those houses and people, where was the closest fresh water? Mm. That's the oh, best. Yeah. Way to go. Uh, but it's also the tricky question. Limestone is a living rock. Uh, we don't have we don't have any fresh water on on the hill today, up on the summit. But there are there is water on the north northeast side, just literally five minutes walk from the from the summit where you do we do have a philosophia. So you do have water sources. We also can see in the winter and in the spring that water seeps up, seeps out from different places on the slopes below the hill. So water is a year-round settlement, but, but it, it's it's a point worth making. Yes. 
Another related question from Finola, was it, um, were there forests there at the time of the buildings? Were there trees there, do you think? Yeah, we, we, to be honest, we, we can't put our finger on that. Uh, they, they, we, would have, we would have more soil cover. So I don't think we're looking at, at a bare rock. Uh, but having said that, it's very extreme and you do have very high winds uh, in that part. So I, I can't really see that you would have the very flat summit forested. And, uh, but of course, comfort is viewed from a 21st century perspective when I say it's exposed. It's exposed to me. Uh, they might not have seen it like that. Or that could have been part of it. And I mean, you could use the word, well, between heaven and the hard place. Um, it also could be linked to penance, could be linked to the fact that you are in an ex exposed place. Um, this is a really good question again. If you were to excavate again, what would you, would you do things differently? Would you look for something else? Yeah, you always would, because you, you always learn something from what you've done. So you have new questions, and the snag, the snag is that we never get any good answers, we just get better questions. Um, so yes, of course, we, I would do slightly differently, but I mean, we would probably, I would love to, 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 um, to uh, understand the date of the large um, 225 meter enclosure, because that is such a strange site. And it's not only really strange, it's actually, I think, is a key to the entire um, understanding of the summit. And, um, and uh, hopefully, you never know, uh, but uh, fingers crossed we might be able to do something. Now that the, the large uh, labyrinth is, we, there's no hope we can ever, ever take that. So. Very good. Um, Khan has asked, would the hazelnuts give any indication of the time of year people were um, at the round structures in the houses? Yeah, well, they, they could, but also the, the snag is that they, they, um, they don't deteriorate. So even if we, you, 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 yeah, they, they, they would have been there when the hazelnut would have been ready to pick. But having said that, that doesn't limit the time uh, that we can assume that they have been there. But we, of course, it's, it's an indication of one part of the year, uh, but it doesn't exclude any other parts of the year. So, uh, but it's a good point. There's lots of interesting uh, suggestions there. Um, I know you mentioned hides, um, Stefan, but Carmel has asked what could have been used for roots of the building? Would they have been made uh, completely out of stone? No, uh, they wouldn't. Um, I, I can't answer that. They, wouldn't, they couldn't have been made out of stone. And the fact is that because when we did excavate, we didn't find any remains of any roof. If, there was, would, if the roof would have been in stone, it would have been collapsing into the hut. Uh, but that has never happened. So I can visualize that you would have, of course, we, had, we would have had timber and woods in the lowlands. So I could see some kind of tepe construction. Um, and that's also the inward leaning slabs I showed one or two images. They could have been keeping those kind of tepe like uh, um, rafters meeting at the, at, the, at the top, like an Indian tepe. And so, um, and then of course, hides to cover that. You could also use this turf to a certain degree to, to, to stabilize the lower part of the wall. Yeah. And, uh, but there's no remains of, of any roofing at all. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Stefan. Brenton, do you have a, a final pick of the question if you want? We're nearly nine o'clock now. You're on mute. Sorry, Prangeli. Yeah, yeah I was. No <laughs> There's a couple more interesting um, suggestions. Michael Canavan, um, could the labyrinth have been used as a collection point for the stones used in construction of the house? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, well, the labyrinth, the labyrinth is, is, uh, is just, it's more like a pattern laid out on the pavement. So it's extremely low uh, profile. And as I said, I, I was, was not joking. It's actually, it's anything from half an inch thick to about a foot. So it, it differs a lot and it's very, very low key. So it's something that has been laid out and constructed on top of the pavement in this strange pattern. So, and there's no quarrying linked to the labyrinth. It actually like it sits on the pavement. But it also has some really interesting excluding zones around it of about 35 meters. So you have a distance to all the houses around it. And it's, um, well, I can only say that prehistoric archaeology is fantastic because we, uh, um, we don't have any good answers, but it's such a challenge and such a privilege 
to 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 get opportunity to excavate something like this and try to create a narrative around things like this. A couple more quick ones. Carolyn and Sue Rabin, um, are there caves nearby on the hill where mortuary practices could take place as per Mullig Farm? There aren't any, I don't know, any caves near close to Turk Hill. No, I don't. Um, Mullig Farm, yeah, we do have caves, yeah, it's within the Brickley Mountains uh, where Mullig Farm is located, but not close to the hot sites as such. So that kind of, there's no tight link between that. Okay, and, and um, just one more from Michael Glen Martin. You mentioned the date before for the cairn, but has there been any attempt to excavate into the cairn? This is the main cairn. Yeah, no, uh, there hasn't. And it's, 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 as you can see behind on, on the image of Michael John Connolly, uh, the left hand side of the cairn is fairly, fairly ruined. Uh, but no attempts have been, that, have been made to excavate into the cairn. No, uh, we haven't. And, uh, um, no, there's no plans for that. It's, it's, uh, okay, um, I'll sign off and hand to Pranjali, um, but I think that's just a brilliant um, talk, Stefan. Fascinating. And I think what's really lovely is for us to have the opportunity to share your research with our members um, across the world. Uh, so we're really grateful for all those, um, all of you for participating tonight and Stefan for sharing your story. We hope to bring you more amazing stories from the barn in the future, but maybe for now, uh, thank you, Stefan, and back to Pranjali. Yeah, yeah, thank you again. Uh, a final thanks to all our members who are tuned in today from, you know, some from Limerick and Claire and Galway, um, Roscommon, also San Francisco and Arizona. So um, some overseas uh, supporters of Burren Beer Trust, thank you all very much for, for tuning in this evening. And um, please, um, please log in again at this time next month, second Wednesday of next month, which is the 12th of May at eight o'clock. Uh, and we have another very interesting talk with uh, Woodland Ecologist uh, Jenny Roach who will talk to us about her latest research on the only stand of native pine in the Burren. So I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, but just for this evening, have a, have a very good night. And thank you again, Stefan. Have a good night. Again. Thank you so much. Very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.